AB5 with one lone pair. What was the molecular shape? Square, Square pyramid. pyramid. Polar, nonpolar? Polar. Polar. Okay. AB4 with two lone pairs. What's molecular shape? Square planar. Okay. Nonpolar. Good. Any squeezing? No. Circle this one as weird. Circle that one as weird. The only two that you have that you have lone pairs that you're nonpolar and you don't get squeezed. So there's nothing about the nonpolar. No. For us, one. no. The reason, and that's a good point to bring up. Yes, in nature, there's occasionally seven. We're not going to deal with that. It'd actually be one up, one down, seven, or pardon me, five in the plane run. You are so crowded, it's not going to happen. Or it's going to be so infrequent, we don't worry about it in this class. Because once you get to less than 100 degrees, that is bad news. That's crowding. Now. Let's do this real quick. There were a couple of sections here. I can see now I skipped over. What if you have to deal with these organic things? And I know you dealt with, some of you went ahead and did these on lab 15. But let's go through. Is there anything in this molecule that's going to violate the octet rule? Hydrogen. How many does the hydrogen always, always, always need? Two. And so if you go through... Let's do this. This is organic because it's a carbon and hydrogen compound. Organic chemistry has some problems that we do not have in inorganic. Their problem is there's no clear-cut central atom. And so let's go through and let's go through this. We already know this violates carbon. For us, never violates. And so I have two carbons. Each carbon needs how many? Nikki up front? Um, four. No, nobody comes with um, eight. eight. Each hydrogen needs how many? Tanya? One. No, that's what it or comes two. with. Two. Okay, so let's see, that's 24. Now let's think about available. Okay, each carbon comes with how many, Meredith? And each hydrogen, Bruce, comes with one. one. So we have eight, four, twelve. So that tells us to go share how many, Sarah? Twelve. Now, here's what you do. For these organic ones that you might run into, just put your carbons in a line. Whether you have two or ten of them, just string them out. And divvy up your hydrogens. Fairly. Just have these here. Now, if you're going to share 12, can we have only single bonds? No. No, because if I do just single bonds, I've just shared 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay, we've got to share 12. This is not the same issue as leftovers. How do we resolve that? Double bond. Double bond. Where, who's got the double? Carbon. The carbons. Why can't hydrogen have a double? Because it, it can only take two. It can only take two. That's, here's something good to remember about hydrogen. Number one, hydrogen can never be a central atom because it can't bond to more than one thing. So when you have these things, hydrogen always had to go around the edges. That's one thing. Secondly, a hydrogen can never have a double or a triple bond. It's only going to have singles. Now, when you do this, and this is what organic chemists have to do. you got to designate who is your central atom. I'm going to just pick one at random. You can pick the right one, you can pick the left one. I don't care. Let's pick this one to talk together. Okay, now, this number of atoms directly bonded to the central. And we would say what, Nina? Three. Three. Excellent. And that was a stumbling block when we were doing lab 15 last time. It has a hydrogen. There's one. Here's two. This carbon makes it three. And I don't care how much trash is hanging off the end of this molecule. It could go for another hundred carbons. Doesn't matter. 
its number directly bonded up here, and I think I wrote better language in lab 15. Number directly bonded. You see, too, it doesn't matter how much junk's hanging off the edge, it doesn't matter you have a multiple bond. You just count atoms because where this first bond goes, the second has to follow. So we say three atoms. Antonio, do I have any lone pairs on that central atom? No. No. So our number of things here, Hina? Three. Three. So orientation, Pedro? Trigonal. Trigonal. Planar. Okay, molecular shape here then, Pedro? Trigonal planar. It's going to be the same. Trigonal planar. So if I try to sketch this, I would take my designated carbon, and I would do something like that, trigonal planar. Okay, now, if I did glance over at this second carbon, it would be identical, wouldn't it? Because it has one, two, three. So my second carbon here is also, this is just extra, you don't have to think about this right now. But that molecule is going to look like that. Now, we have our orientation, we have our molecular shape. Now when we talk about bond angle, we're talking, whenever you talk about an angle, it is nucleus to nucleus to nucleus, and this is not drawn well at all. If your models would show this better, our bond angle would be what? 120. 120, good. Now, here's another issue. Carbon and hydrogen, and this is new to you all, at least for me it's new. Carbon and hydrogen have almost so much the same value for electronegativity. When you have a CH bond, it is essentially nonpolar. If you have just nonpolar bonds, the whole business has to be nonpolar no matter what the shape. So here's the bottom line hydrocarbons are nonpolar. End of story. You don't have to even know the shape. <clears throat> so if it says C2H4, it could say C20H whatever. It's still nonpolar. Okay, so polarity for all hydrocarbons. I gave you some wonderful generalizations before. Carbon compounds are covalent. Hydrogen compounds are covalent. Now, Hydrocarbons are nonpolar. There's another wonderful generalization to have. Okay, number of resonance forms? Zero. Okay, now, in your, yeah, Andrew? So, uh, we had a double bond because you had a shift flow. Uh -huh. So, we didn't have any little pairs because. There were none left over. We'd used them all. If I'd gone back and I'd checked how many available, I had 12 available. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So, just say, say if there were, were like 16... Then they would have gone on the central. Yeah. See, carbon's not going to violate the octet rule, so yeah. that's... Yeah, I'm just saying if you yeah. were to have 16, then you would have... Exactly. ...two long pairs. Exactly. Now, I want to shift gears. Now, I've got a half an hour to shift gears in. Here's what we just did. We have gone through this whole chapter, and we took every molecule, or almost every molecule they had in the chapter, and we used only the Vesper theory. And we predicted shape and polarity and angles and all of the above, and everything we did was wonderful. Okay, when you're using the Vesper theory, you are not thinking about the needs of the central atom. You are thinking of the needs of the junk out around. Because the whole premise of the Vesper theory is Count your things around your central atom, spread them out to get as much turf for themselves as possible. Two things went linear. And who cared about the central atom? Okay, the valence bond is going to take it from the other approach. And I'm going to run through the entire chapter here in half an hour. And we're going to look at this other theory briefly. Okay, that other theory called valence bond, which is back in section four, that what it talked about, what's the needs of the central atom? Because when you want to bond with somebody, okay, I am an atom. I have an atomic orbital. 
I have a lone, not a lone pair, but an unpaired electron here. I want to bond with somebody. Andrew, put out your arm. Okay, he's an atom too. He's got an atomic orbital with one unpaired electron in it. This is how a bond forms. His atomic orbital overlaps with my atomic orbital. And he's got one unpaired, I got one unpaired, and now we're both very happy. Okay? Yeah, that's what a bond has to be. Well, if that's the case, you know, a, an S orbital, that's spherical. I mean, I could just come at his S orbital from any direction. Okay, but P orbitals, remember how P orbitals came in sets of three? They were at angles to each other, weren't they? What angle? If I remember the P orbitals, the sets of three, the X, Y, Z, so they're at 90 degrees. Okay, if nothing happened to atomic orbitals, okay, let's say, see if you can visualize this. I have a P orbital here and here. That's one P orbital. And I've got one unpaired electron. I want to go bomb with somebody. Okay, I've got another P orbital, 90 degrees to it. It also has a lone pair, not a, I'm using that term wrong, not a lone pair, but an unshared electron. I'd like to go bond here too. Well, if you just used atomic orbitals, you would expect to find a whole bunch of molecules with angles of 90 degrees. And we don't. It's rare. you got to get up to having five and six things rounded to have a C90. Something must be going on. And this is what the balance bond talks about. Stab it with x-rays to find out its true structure, we would be 100% correct. It is linear, it's nonpolar, all of the above. And okay, now, that was with the Vesper theory. I want to go back, and this is the valence bond approach. I mean, think about the needs of the beryllium. If a beryllium is just sitting around, happy, by itself. Let's look at electron configuration. We know it has a helium core. Now, if we were doing electron configuration of beryllium, after my helium core, Aaron, what would you tell me to do? 2s2, end of story. Okay, and that is correct if beryllium is just hanging out by itself. Now, if I saw that, I would predict, since these are already paired, remember when I bonded with Andrew, you had to have an unpaired electron? I would predict beryllium would do nothing, would not bond with anybody. Here's the theory, and it's fantasy time. Okay, but that's okay. It helps us explain. You know, we go around every day just believing stuff's going to happen in a certain way. Like if I stood up on here and stepped off, I have faith I'm going to fall because I believe in gravity. Okay, and you do too. But you don't, probably don't really understand it. Okay, so follow along, hang on. I can almost promise an aha everybody's going to have. So don't tune out if it seems bizarre. Okay. In order to make beryllium bond with two things, I need two unpaired. Okay, so in our bag of tricks, let's put a tiny bit of energy investment in. Here's my 2S. Here's a 2P that's empty, still hanging around. Remember, those orbitals are just regions in space where electrons can be found. They're there whether they're being used or not. So I'm going to do that. Now my theory fits the facts better because I could see 
Okay, here comes one chlorine in to overlap with this, and a second chlorine in to overlap with this. I see some of you writing this down. It's really not necessary. Just follow along because at the end of this, I'm going to say, here's the bottom line. Okay, but I just want you to see what kind of crazy fantasies people had to come up with this explanation. This theory is not as concrete as the Vesper, where you can say things around, boom, boom. Okay, we think about promotion. The problem with this part is if you have a chlorine that comes in and overlaps with the 2S orbital, you will have a stronger, shorter bond than if you have a chlorine that comes in and overlaps with a 2P. So, we got to do something more in our fantasy world. We're going to think hybridization. Now, I don't use that word hybridization exactly like biologists do when they talk about hybrids and crossing corn or wheat or whatever or animals. No, hybridization, if you don't like that word, use the word mixing. So we're saying we're going to take those two, we are going to mix them or hybridize, and if you take two atomic orbitals, we will come out with two new hybrid orbitals, and we will name them exactly what we used to mix. This is called an SP, this is called an SP, and then I have these two that I have left alone. Okay, now, and let me go to the other picture here. I've got two hybrid orbitals. You've seen this one before, but I didn't point out what they were really trying to show. You got two new hybrid orbitals. You got a beryllium in the middle. My new hybrid orbitals, they want to spread out in space to get as much turf for themselves as possible. So, one goes this way, and I call it an SP. It's got one unpaired electron in it. If this is going to go the opposite direction to stay away from this one. That one's called an SP. Now I can visualize, here comes the chlorine in, overlaps. Remember Andrew and I overlapping our orbitals? Like so. Now, what is the bottom line? I think I had this up on the board before, but I didn't try to explain anything. Number of things. Hybridization on central. You have two things. And we go clear up to having six things. Any time you have two things around the central atom, you're going to say the hybridization state on that central atom is SP. Those green parts, these lobes, when you first glance at that, that sure looks like something you learned before, and it looks like one P orbital. Uh-uh. No more. This lobe over here is an SP hybrid. That lobe over there is the other SP hybrid trying to get away from its neighbor. So they would be at 180 degrees to each other. So on your lab 15, that last column, where it says hybridization state, you hunt down through that, and anytime you said two things, that this is an always, always, always thing. You know, like if you have two things, orientation is always linear. Okay, hybridization, if you have two things, is always SP. Now, in anybody's spot, in lab 15, if you got it handy, in anybody's spot, another molecule we did, or you have done, yeah, Brittany? What? It's a H2Cl. H2Cl? C-O. Okay, that's going to have more than two things. <coughs> CS2. Ah, I'll take that one. CS2, carbon disulfide. Whoops.
Oops. You do the Lewis Dodd carbon disulfide. This is what you get. Two things. So now I would point at the carbon and I say, what's the hybridization state on your central atom? And you will now say SP. Because carbon could have, of course, we never see the, the electrons. We really don't know what they're doing. So this could be absolutely wrong, but until we come up with a better story, we're sticking to it. And so we say, oh, we have promotion, and then we have this mixing, and then we can get atomic orbitals that are out in the correct directions to agree with what we really find in the laboratory.